I'm going to the showers, I've got a, a blanket put over me. And um, everybody just rushed me. Everybody? I yeah, I have to get into all the ties because you don't, you don't punch a tie and get away with it. Another girl from a bar, she's, so she said, like, I haven't had any cocaine for a couple of weeks. I said, oh, I haven't had any cocaine for 17 years. <laughs> get a couple of grams in. And we were locked into the room for two weeks. 150 people in a room with two toilets oh. and a bucket for shower. And the food gets put in every day. For two weeks, we were like that. It got out of hand and someone gets, got stabbed. And with the ties, it doesn't, things don't really get out of hand that much because they're so calm people. But once they go, they go. They've separated it and they've got the two parts. And that's what was used to, to stab this um, tie guy. And they just picked him up, threw him out, and, and that was it. They take it in turns to sleep because right. there's not enough room on the floor. So five people have to stand up to subdue everybody else. So when you see that, you just have to be on your best behavior because that could potentially happen to you. So, and I saw them be many people in there, many people. Basically, this lady boy still have their parts, but they have silicone breasts. So they have two rows of the shower. So they're like VIP, they treat it like VIP. I mean, this, I was shocked. I've never seen anything like that before. I'm traumatized by that. I have nightmares about that. I don't think we've interviewed someone who has been out of prison as recently as D. Four months out, so you can imagine he's going through the adjustment that we've all gone through. And foreign prisons are a much different intensity level of homeland prisons. Mm. <laughs> as you're about to hear with, with D's story. So... You know, graphic content warning, it's, it's going to be, there's going to be some hardcore, many of you have seen what we've done with David McMillan, some of the other guys have been in Thai prison, but you know, huge thank you for coming on, because yes, when I got you. out of prison, I, I, it took a bit for me to feel like able to tell my story. Yeah, well, you've kind of inspired me with your channel and I've seen what you've done in the past and I thought I'll get in touch and, and try to start the healing process really, because in my experience, I know talking about trauma helps, you know, it, it's part of the healing process. So that's why I put myself up. And shout out to Mark Dempster as well. Yes. If you've not seen Mark's pods, we've done two of him. Before we get into your life story, let's just take the viewers into, give them a glimpse into the Thai prison then. What, what's like the craziest stuff that you saw in the prison? A murder. A murder. And a rape. What was the murder over? <sighs> House. Two different houses. What does that mean, two different like, houses? The tires, the way the tires do it, because we're let out during the day. You're not locked in through the day. So once everything's done in the morning, everybody has a house. We've got about 10 people in this house, 10 people in that house, 10 people in that house. And the fight was over a house and someone got stabbed. Why did one house have a problem with another house? I think it was about space. Someone said, that's my space. They said, no, 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 that's not your space. Someone gave me that space. And uh, he got out of hand and someone gets, got stabbed. And with the ties, it doesn't, things don't really get out of hand that much because they're so calm people. But once they go, they go. And I think this is what happened this time. Someone lost face and, um, and there was about 20 people, 20 people on this house fighting 20 people on that house. And where were you while that was going on? Just watching. <laughs> just watching, thinking, what the fuck? Because you see big, they, like the tires, they, they hit all these knives. We didn't even know they were there, like a, like a, um, you know, like a scissors. They've separated it and they've got the two parts. And that's what was used to, to stab this um, tie guy. And they just picked him up, threw him out, and, and that was it. But there's a Commodore there that's really, really hard. I mean, this guy is really hard. Once he come in, Everybody has to 
crouched down on the floor. Everybody had to lie down on the floor and he's walking around with his stick trying to find out what happened. And he got both of the houses to lie down there, both of the houses, and he moved every single person to all different areas so they don't have houses anymore because potentially that's, that's a danger for the prison because it's gangs, really, all from the same area. They do, like, from Sriracha or, or another area of Pattaya. So if they don't get on, they fight each other. And how common are these killings? Uh, but it's rare. Rare? Yeah, it's very rare. But there's fights, but not killings. But, what but you- people dying in hospital is, is a lot. So, you, so you're yeah. watching this killing then? Yeah. I imagine you've not seen killings before. I've never seen anyone die before. What is going through your head as you're seeing this? Fuck. Shock. I mean, we, you talk to the foreigners thinking, what the fuck, man? Look at just what happened. That guy was there one minute and then next minute he's, he's, he's dead. He's did, gone. Did you know the guy previously? Yes, of course. Yes. I've seen him around. He's, he's a nice guy. I don't know him personally, but this is somebody you see every day. Because you see everybody in the prison. There's a thousand people in the wing, in the dan. And um, from 7.30 till 4 o'clock, they're out. Does that then change your mindset permanently that this stuff really happens? I got to be on the ball. Well, I mean, I got beaten up. So I was, I was, I knew the dangers of everything when I first got there. Because I'm quite a big guy. And when I first got in, it was like people were pushing. When you sleep... Because let's say there's a room like this size here with, let's say, 50 people. 50? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That is a crowd. <laughs> with 50 people. Let's say the people in the reception wing, they've got people who actually run the, re- the prisoners run the, the reception. They run the prison. So they have their bed space and there's room. But there's another part. Everybody that just comes into the prison they get put in that corner there. No matter how many people comes in, they will go in that corner. Even if there's 10 spaces here for people to still sleep in. So everybody just gets pushed into one area here. There's a Thai word for it. It's called sleeping siap. So it's like this. One person will have their leg over your shoulder and you'll have your leg over their shoulder. And the way it's done, everybody is like this. They pack it in, pack it in, pack it in. And then it's a sleep. And then you have to quickly go like this. And it got a bit too much for me, really. I pushed someone, they pushed me. We got into a scuffle. The next day, I'm going to the showers. I got a, a blanket put over me. And um, everybody just rushed me. Everybody? I in, yeah, I have to get into all the ties. Because you don't, you don't punch a tie and get away with it. And that's my mistake. I was pushed, I punched someone, and um, they marked me. The next day, I was going to have a shower, blanket over me so I don't see who's, who's hitting. Bam, 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 bam. And um, it was over in three seconds, really, but the damage had been done. Just going back to the sleep thing, because I'm curious, because I've never experienced this in my life. I've experienced some squalid conditions, but not like what you said. So everyone's like limbs are kind of like intertwined and stuff. Yes. And you're all sleeping in a certain position. We, 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 start, we start like this. Yeah. So they can pack everybody in. Yeah. Outside in. And then they say, sleep. And then everybody have to quickly get into a position where you sleep like this. But someone's got their leg here and I've got my leg over somebody here. So it's like sardines. So yes. was it very apparent during the pandemic being that you've only just been released? <laughs> during the pandemic was even worse because in my room during the pandemic, there was 150 people in the room. And what they did, COVID was everywhere. So they got everybody to go in the locker and get all their stuff. So we got everything that we own, we take it into the room and we were locked into the room for two weeks. 150 people in a room with two toilets and a bucket for shower. And the food gets put in every day. For two weeks, we were like that. No room, nothing. This, this was horrendous. This was terrible. So when they say sleep, you've got to get in your position. Say you want to change position in the night. <laughs> <laughs> i got you, to do that every so many see, hours. I'm like, i got to go on this side, I'm on this side. I'm on the this thing side. is, nobody sleeps really. Because you have to be really, really careful. Because I'll tell you another story. It's like, 
they put up they, I had to move another another commodore come to my building and he wanted to kind of reshuffle everything so he got everybody in one room I mean I'm sleeping over here and the toilet is let's say the toilet is over there but I can't go from here to go to the toilet I have to go back climb onto the bed come out again come down again and use the toilet there and I have to be really really careful that I don't step on somebody I mean there's no room on the floor there is no room on the floor so I have to climb up to the bed go like this and climb down again and use the toilet that's I'm here the toilet's here but I have to go that way and what's it to like, the obviously, the to going to the toilet with that many people in the room, surely well, starts fights. Well, people were asleep fights. at that time, you know. It, it, but when you first go in there and you want to use the toilet and everybody's like looking at you, you can't. It took me maybe three weeks to use the toilet oh, to do a number no. two. <laughs> really oh, bad. Oh, it's painful. Yeah, really bad. I couldn't go. No, oh, I'm not surprised. <gasps> yeah, I couldn't go. So you said the other most brutal thing that you saw was a rape. Yeah, somebody mm. got raped in the toilet. Did you know who that person was? Yeah. And what, yeah. were they in there? Was it a local person or was it a foreigner? All, all, this, all the violence happened amongst the Thais. Amongst the Thais. Yeah, amongst the Thais. And he was a gang who raped this guy. Did, and there's it, nothing anyone can do. Was there a reason for it? <sighs> somebody wanted to do something like that and they did it. And there's nothing you can do. Is there just kind of like a sense that something like that's about to happen? No, no. It just it just happens. I mean, I I was just there in the toilet. I mean, I, I'll tell you about the toilets. It, let's say you've got six toilets that way, six toilets this way, and everybody's crouching down. And you want to, especially this happens at the weekends from Friday till Sunday. You want to go to the toilet and people are just masturbating. Oh. All, all the toilets are busy and people are just, and you just think, what? I mean, <laughs> you just think, what is going on? How, here? how far away from this person were you when he was getting uh, raped? I was in the toilet. And so I a few can, feet away. There then. was a group of people actually watching. They were watching. I think, what's going on there? Oh, shit. Oh. I mean, this, I was shocked. I've never seen anything like that before. I'm traumatized by that. I have nightmares about that. I'm not surprised. Really? I mean, this was this was scary. I've never experienced anything like this before in my life. But I saw it with my very eyes. And um, yeah, it's not it's not a good thing to see. It's Did you see him thing. after? Yeah. And then he, 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 was, he was finished. He was broken. He was broken. Because that's the worst thing you can do to a guy in a prison like that. And it happened to him. I mean, it's... It's like, you see, there's molesters in there, like prey on young ties. And um, when I first got in there, I mean, when I first got in there, I kind of want to say something. But and then in the end, I learned to like, just D, you got to stay out of this. This has got nothing to do with you. Because I experienced this young kid and this old man keep just trying to touch him. I said this couple of things, people warned me, said D, don't get involved, man. Just leave him, get on with it. And that was difficult for me to let that go. It was hard when I first got in there. But over the years, I kind of learned to be hardened to it. You just turn your blind eye because the ties are ties. They're going to do what they're going to do. And the foreigners are going to do what they're going to do. But you learn to just mind your own business. Wow. So that's quite a brutal glimpse into the, you know, D, what you experienced. Now we're going to go back and find out how the hell he ended up in there. Uh, yeah. So, you grew from up London? <sighs> yeah, Kent from Kentish London, Town. Camden, Kentish Town. Um, Amy Winehouse is from there, wasn't she? Hmm? Amy Winehouse. Oh, yeah, yeah, I met her once, actually. Yeah, mm. I met her once and um, didn't really speak to her. But uh, I was working on a store in Camden Market and she walked by. But, yeah, I'm from, like, around Kentish Town. I was brought up with, like, foster parents. You know, I was like rebellious, um, got into a bit of trouble when I was young, um, started smoking cannabis, um, speed. And then in 1989, ecstasy, come out, 88, 89, 
and I got heavily. I mean, that was it's still the best times of my life, really. <laughs> 80, 80, 89, you know, it was, <laughs> it was, it was great. I mean, not it's like in '88, not a lot of people knew about it. So I was a part of the group that really started everything off, and uh, and uh, went to parties like um, Futures, Back to the Future, Sunrise. Um, went to Heaven on the Monday. I think it was Land of Oz. On the Thursday, I think it was Trip. At the Astoria it was Trip. So, and then a couple of people started selling ease in um, yeah in the local area, and I got laid on some ease. But me being a party person, once you take one, start giving them away. And, and I owe this guy some money. Um, but one day, they, they, and I left the area because I, I was scared, you know, I was scared. And then they tracked me down to this club in um, Tottenham Court Road. And I got chased down the road. And, um, and this guy's basically cut me. They cut me from, from here. All the way here. Oh, I can wow. see that. Yeah, and here. Um, and now, I, I mean, I thought I was going to die. I mean, the taxi driver, there was a taxi driver who actually thought, he saw me on the, I think he was on the Friday. And then the, next, the following Friday, I was back at the club again with a big bandage on, my, bandage on my face. And he actually told me, he said, he thought I'll die. Because it, I was like, lied on the floor. And I was like thirsty and I was asking for water. And the policeman was saying, no, don't, don't fall asleep. It was like, it was really peaceful at that time, you know, where I'm thinking, you oh, know, I just want water. The police officer, keep your eyes open, don't fall asleep, don't fall asleep. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I got through it. Did it happen too fast or did you feel it going in? Well, the, the car? Yeah. <sighs> Didn't, you don't feel it. Fast. Yeah, just, yeah, you don't feel it. So, and then I left, I kind of left the area and um, and I really got involved. I really got addicted. I, my addiction really got overhand, smoking crack, drinking tenants and special brew. And um, in 1997, I got clean. I went to rehab. Um, and this is where my life kind of changed, you know, through... I was introduced to Narcotics Anonymous and, um, and for the very first time in my life, I had direction in my life. You know, um, I did everything that was suggested. I managed to get myself a job for the very first time. And, and to be honest with you, I thought, wow, this is what I should have done a long, long time ago. Because mm -hmm. I thought being on the door was like the in thing, you know, and I realized that, fuck, it's it's better to have a shitty job than not to have a job at all. Mm. And um, my flat, while I was using, I hold a lot of money on it. I was in arrears. And, um, and I remember being like about three months clean or six months clean. They took me to the county court because I still weren't paying my rent. And, um, and I was at the court and the judge asked me, he said, Mr. D, why ain't you been paying your rent? And I said, oh, you know, I'm an addict. He said, I don't care if you're an addict or not. If you don't pay your rent now, we're not going to write to you. The bailiffs are just going to come, get your stuff and move you out. And I learned a very valuable lesson that day. Um, I got myself a job and I paid up. I paid off that, those arrears. And I bought the flat, my council flat in, um, in Hampstead. <clears throat> Mortgage responsible members of the, the uh, community, went back to university, did a diploma in counselling, and I got myself a job in hostels, night shelters, and treatment centres, and I did really, really well. I was doing, started going on holidays. I'd never been anywhere before. I was afraid to leave my area, but for the very first time, I went to Spain, Italy, Greece, you know, all over the place. And then I, I someone, so I just said, why don't you go to Thailand? And, um, and I went to Thailand and I went to Bangkok. I didn't really like Bangkok. And then I went to Koh Samui and I fell in love with this island, mm. you know, beautiful island. Um, I, I think I only went for about three weeks, spent another week there, four weeks, and I came back to England and um, I decided I'm going to live there. So I remortgaged my flat. 
um, put everything in storage, rented out the flat. I went to live in Thailand. And um, the first year was okay. And then um, run out of money. I kind of sold the flat from there, lived there for another couple of year, 18 months, then run out of money again and then come back. And then um, I desperately wanted to live there. So I'm on the internet, got onto this website called thaivisa.com. And there was a job there for a personal trainer. And, and I've been trained as a personal trainer. So I send this guy my CV and he said, oh, have a look on that website. And it turns out it's the first English speaking rehab in Southeast Asia. The geezer said, I don't want you as a personal trainer. I want you as a counselor. When can you get out? So I went, was in Koh Samui for about six months and I was running out of money again. So I phoned the guy up and said, have you had your holiday? He said, come. So I went to Kanchanaburi. There's an area in Thailand called Kanchanaburi, and it's the, one of the only places that got, that's got cemeteries um, because the Allied soldiers, is, that's where the bridge over the river Kwai is, um, El Fire Pass. And this was built by Allied soldiers from can Canada, New Zealand, Australia. And um, the Japanese treated them really, really bad, so it's documented. So it's, it's kind of like a tourist uh, attraction place. So I stayed with him <clears throat> for about a year and um, things didn't kind of work out too well in the end. So I left and then I managed to get myself a job offshore, earning really good money. I mean, I, I had a good life out there. And then um, a couple of years later, or two, three years later, I met this, this lady, this Thai lady. And initially, I kind of keep myself safe. I mean, I didn't want to... I know what happens in Thailand with women because all your money either goes or you get a broken heart. And I kept myself okay for a long, long time. And I met this one girl, you know, that I fell in love with her. And, um, and there was big warning signs initially because she, she's married to a German guy. And she said to me, look, I've been married to my husband, but I'm a, we're in an open relationship. It's okay for me to have affairs. And me, not, because I don't want to commit. I want somebody who's not, and I, I, I got in there. And it was cool for two years. It was, it was okay. And then one day she rang me and said, Dee, can I borrow some of your money? I said, oh, how much do you need? She said like about 20,000 baht, which is about maybe four or 500 quid. I said, okay, no problem. Went to the back, bank, gave it to her. Said to her, if you need any more, just let me know. A week later, she wants another 20. Whoa. I said, what's going on, babe? It's not like you. I've known you 20, I've known you like two years. You've never asked me for a penny. The space of a week, you want 40,000 baht. What's going on? Oh, D, I've got this on the house. I've got a credit card, bills to pay, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, how are you going to pay me back? Because this ain't free. She said, look, <laughs> just give me about four or five months. After that, I'll pay you 5,000 back every month out of my wages. I said, well, all right, cool. But that night, we, I was supposed to give her the money that night. She was like about two hours late. I'm waiting at, uh, outside the restaurant where we're supposed to meet. And... Um, Something starts to tell me that something ain't right with this girl. We ate, went back to my place, and then she said, oh, I'm going up. I said, oh, usually you stay. What, what, what's going on? She said, no, I wanna, I'm tired. I want to sleep at my own bed. And I followed her. And uh, she, didn't go, <laughs> she didn't go home. She did a turning, which wasn't, wasn't her way home. So I followed, followed her. And the bike was parked outside this house, and there was a karaoke place just down the road. I thought, oh, she's in there with a Thai guy. I thought, oh, shit, she's taking money off me and giving it to a Thai guy. But that's not what actually happened. My friend leaves two doors away from where the bike was parked. So I knocked on his door. I said, what's happening in that house there? He told me they're gambling in there. Gambling? Yeah. She was addicted to gambling. And me, like a counsellor, what did I do? I said, look, do you owe these people any more money? She said, yeah, ten, ten, another 10,000. So I went to the back, said, look, 
this, this, I'm paying this off now. Don't, don't gamble anymore. She said, no, yeah, dear, I'm not going to gamble anymore. It's 50,000 back. Three months later, when she's got to pay the money back, I don't want to hold you. I don't want to know you anymore, dear. The relationship's over. I'm not paying you. This ruined me, man. This, this broke my heart. It really, really ruined me. Um, where got to, I got a bit obsessive over it. Um, the last thing I think about before I go to bed is the first thing that I think about as soon as I wake up. I was like basically following this girl around, you know. I, I got a bit, you know, got a bit obsessive really. And the, the more I do that, she didn't want to know. And then one day, somebody, somebody suggested to me, I, I, I picked up an, another girl from a bar and she's, so I said, D, I haven't had any cocaine for a couple of weeks. I said, oh, I haven't had any cocaine for 17 years. <laughs> Get a couple of grams in. She bought two grams of coke, went back to my house, did that. What was the first rush like? <laughs> it was great. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. It was good. But the, 17 the, the years most, clean. yeah, the most, the, the, and she, she left. She said, D, can another girl, do you know any, anybody else that can come? I said, yeah, I do. And this other girl came and I asked her, do you want any coke? She said, no, I like methamphetamine. <laughs> and um, I mean, <laughs> I said, all right, go and get a gram. And that was, that was me finished. I was gone. The powerlessness that we speak about in the room came back straight away. All my old behavior come back straight away. You know, me borrowing money, not paying it back, me letting people down again. You know, I've been in that country for such a long time that people respected me, people liked me. And within a week, all that went down, went downhill. Um, I mean, it's really embarrassing to say that people, you know, I, I hurt people. I hurt people, you know, people that liked me, people that respected me. I abused their trust. They borrowed me money. I didn't have... I had no intentions of paying it back. Um, I, I'll tell a story. Um, this, this guy, I rang him. I said, look, my rehab needs a thousand pounds to stay afloat. Um, can you help me out? And I borrowed money off this guy before that I hadn't paid back. And he said, look, get one of your workers to confirm what, what you're saying. I've got someone to say that, yeah. So he said, give me your bank details. So he wires the money over, and when they, when I showed me the the print, it got my name wrong, and they told me at the bank that they're not going to give me this money. So I rang him back. I said, "Look, cancel that transaction and send Western Union instead." So he did that, but the money came. I took the money, spent it, I smoked it, sleeping. Next day, I had an alert on my phone. Dun, 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 dun. Looked on the looked on the thing. The money come through. So instead double. of me, yeah, instead of me ringing him to give it back, went to Bangkok, bought more drugs, and um, I think about two weeks later, rang me. And said, "D, did I pay you double?" I said, "No." And then he rang me about a week later. I said, "D, are you sure?" And I I, I put the phone down on him. You know, I was so embarrassed. I was so full of shame. It was bad. And um, basically, I, I moved. Yeah, by then, I moved from Kosimui to Pattaya because Pattaya is a lot cheaper. It's a lot more seedy. It's a lot, you know, I can... Well, I lasted three months there. Um, one girl rang me and said, Dee, have you got anything to smoke? I said, no, I'm going to Bangkok tomorrow to get some. So... Woke up early in the morning, as usual, got on the bus to Bangkok, got what I needed to get. I think I bought, I asked for 20 grams. And um, on my way back, she rang me again on the bus. I said, I'll be about 20 minutes. So I'm on my bike. I've looked at the bus garage, yeah, the bus station. I looked around thinking, let's make sure there's no police here. And I noticed a fat guy. I thought, I can't be police, you know. I got on my bike, I'm like dreaming of the first smoke, you know. I'm, 
what I'm going to do. I see two uniformed police officers on the, on the bike. I thought, oh, it's not a problem. I don't have a helmet on. It's only cost me, it's going to cost, cost me 200 baht. I've got that. So I look behind me, there's like 20 police officers with guns. <laughs> they said, and they, they played back the conversation I had with, with the girl. They said, we know what you, what you went to Bangkok for. Where's the drugs? So I had it in two, two lumps like this, 10, 10. I gave it to them and I said to them, how much is it gonna cost for this to go away? Which is the, that's the first thing you, you say, they said like 50,000 baht and I didn't have 50,000 baht. But the person that could have given me that 50,000 baht was one of the guys that I even, in my audacity, I even rang him. The guy that I took the 2,000 pounds from, he, he just put the phone down on me. <laughs> yeah, my audacity. I mean, when you smoke that stuff, it just, anyway, I couldn't get anybody. And um, they took me to my condo. I couldn't get the money. We was there for about 45 minutes. They said, no, we got to go now. They got no time. So they took me to another safe house. This is when their boss came and said, the boss said, how much has he got anyway? And when they weighed it, it weighed 30 grams. And she said, no, this is too much drugs, blah, blah, blah. And, um, but I knew I only had 20 grams. Uh, you go, you go long time, you 25 years, 30 years, you know, thinking, oh. but I knew I wasn't going to do that much, but I didn't know they were going to give me that much. So they charged me before they charged me, they said, oh, you want to call Bangkok and get somebody you, you said so don't even nah. so they charged me um <clears throat> took pictures is that what they do there they just parade great people like like this and then all the police that arrested you will be at the back the drugs will be here and you sit there like this full of shame like this and they'll take picture and that will be shown on their local tv and um went downstairs i think yeah I had my passport and I, they took my phone, but I was able to buy my phone back for 500 baht. So I got my phone back, phoned the girl up that grasped me up and said, why, why did you do it? I said, I had to, they, someone did it to me, I had to do it to you. And um, there was this, there was a, a foreigner, it's kind of like a, he's got a Swedish passport, but he's, he's from the Middle East. And he came and said, oh, dear, we can help you. Please, not guilty, blah, because I, I just put my hand up. I ain't going to act. They caught me back to rights. And he said, look, we can get you off. I said, you can't get me off. They're taking pictures of me, taking this thing out of my, my pocket. Anyway, I said, look, there's a couple of people here that you can call. They might get me some money in that. I said, whatever you do, don't call my family. And, um, and then he went to court with me on the the next day on the Saturday, because, ah, the police station. You've got just, the police station is just, yeah, nothing there. It's just the concrete floor. And then no blanket, no pillow, no food, nothing. You just, just put you in there. Are there and other my, people in there? Yeah, loads of Thai people. And I was like the star, because 30 grams, everybody's seen my discharge. Oh, <laughs> oh 30 grams, oh. Jamburi, Jamburi, you're going to the big man prison for 25 years, 25 years. <laughs> and every, uh, this is what every, every time somebody comes, oh yeah, oh, 25. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and um, slept on the, slept or well, tried to sleep on the concrete floor, lights on. And that was, the, that was the style of the nightmare, really, because the light was never switched off since that day for five years. Mm -hmm. Didn't sleep with the lights off for five years. And um, yeah, so he came to court with me, went to the police, went to the court. They reminded me in custody. And um, this is where we got to the prison. Take off all your clothes, everything. Um, it's a good thing I was actually wearing shorts because anything long, they just cut. Like your jeans, they will cut it. I had long sleeve shirts, they cut that. Um, I mean, open your mouth, spread your, bend down, spread your cheeks, lift your balls, 
it was so embarrassing, so humiliating. It was it was terrible. And then one one of the trustees must have seen me looking at the food because I hadn't eaten. He said, "You want something to eat?" <laughs> so I stuffed my face and um, what was the food? Oh, that's horrible, but I had to eat something because I hadn't eaten in a while. When you're smoking ice, you don't you don't really eat. You know, it takes away your appetite and your ability to sleep. So those two things I hadn't done in a while. And um, so they matched us. This was on a Saturday. Everybody's looking at the new new recruit, you know. But there are people there that have been there many times. They just, you can tell, because they're just talking to the Commodores. And, and then we went into the room and this is where I, I could not believe where I was sleeping. I could not believe it. You know, sleeping like this, sleeping like this. And with me, you know, I, I was having nightmares. I was kicking in my sleep. I was punching because I'm dreaming that I'm fighting people. I'm kicking people. I'm punching people. You know, and people are punching me and pushing me. And um, you know, that was I was in that reception area for about four or five days. Nobody spoke English. Ah, actually, the next day we got taken back to the reception area to take our clothes. So I picked up my clothes. I didn't. The trainers they take off you. You're not allowed to wear anything that covers your toes. But in the prison, you can buy them. Eventually, you can buy them, but they say it's illegal, but it's quite, it, 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 it's legal. So I had no shoes. I was barefoot. And um, and a guy told me, oh, Dad, go and wash your clothes. So I washed my clothes, hanged them up. The next day, I went to, back to get them. They were gone. <laughs> All my, my underwear, my shorts, my shirt, gone and um, I'm I'm trying to complain some that some guy that speaks really broken he said D, this place is full of thieves you have to be more careful what you expect you know so I had to wear the prison clothes and then I think it was about 10 days later I went to the big boys um, that where I met other foreigners and things was it was slowly being explained to me how it runs how it works and um what did they say to you keep yourself to yourself you know um stay with the foreigners you know there was a lot of africans there a lot of a couple of english guys there and um and basically for my first week i was just talking about <laughs> what i've been doing for the last three or four years but the sleeping area still wasn't didn't get any better still didn't get any better it was still like this and um First time, you wake up at six o'clock in the morning, six thirty. You get let out and shout. It's like when you knew you cannot do anything. No, foreigner. No, you can't get any water. No, you can't. What? No, everything's no, no, no. You just stand there thinking, what? So, but you have to watch and follow other foreigners, and um, and that's how you learn to kind of survive. Uh, showering is not, it's not, it's like basically in this wing, you have lady boys. You know, you've heard lady boys, yeah? Yes. Basically, these lady boys still have their parts, but they have silicone breasts. So they have two rows of the shower. So they're like VIP, they're treated like VIP in this particular wing. So they have to shower first and you have to wait, 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 wait. And, um, and the most shocking thing for me, was that weekends is you have the lady boy room. They have their own room for themselves, but it's kind of, it's like a punishment room. If you do something wrong, they'll put you into a lady boy room. And what happens in this lady boy room, when you go in there, they say, take your trousers down. They want to look at your, make sure, because you have skin disease, scabies. I caught scabies, you have scabies, and you can get it on your privates as well. So people want to know whether you've got this, this scabies, and you just itch, itch, itch. Oh, yeah. It was one of the most horrible things that happened to me in there. So they have to examine you, the lady boys. Well, the people that go in there, yeah. So they have to, they tell you to take your pants down. They want to look at your, make sure you haven't got any scabies. Um, and same, same thing. They, they will have spaces. But they'll have a space for the punishment people. So if there's going to be 50 people in there, they'll sleep there. Even to the point that they don't, some of them don't sleep. 
they take it in turns to sleep because right. there's not enough room on the floor. So five people have to stand up for about three hours. After three hours, they wake three people up. They'll get up, stand up, and they'll go to sleep. That's torture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In that room, that punishment room. So, but at weekends, they'll give out lubricant and condoms to the lady boys. And they have tents. There will be a tent at the back. So you can go in there. And coffee is currency. So 50 coffees, 100 coffees, you can go and do what, whatever you want to do in there. And I know somebody who caught HIV from doing that. Wow. Yeah. He went into that prison not having HIV, started going into that tent. Well, he was quite open about it. He's from the Middle East. He was quite... He was quite open. He had his, he had his lady boy girlfriend, and he took care of her. The, you know, it was. I mean, he had a lot of money. His pet, his family were giving him like about <clears throat> two hundred pounds a month, and um, he had his yeah, he had his lady boy. And then after five years, six years, they test everybody for HIV and tuberculosis every year. He got tested. Bang. So every weekend they'd have these tents that people yeah. go into. Yeah. Is it all consensual with the lady oh, boys? Oh, yeah, 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 it's consensual, yeah. They have to pay. Yeah. It's not free for them. They have to pay. And um, so that was happening. And the Africans didn't like that. And I have to explain to the Africans, like, look, this is our minimization. You know, they have to give out the condoms and the lubricant because if they don't give them out, people are going to do that anyway. So it's best to keep it safe. So that's another thing that was kind of shocking. And then you, <clears throat> and then I got, ah, there's this one Commodore, he's a sadist. This man is really, really horrible to the ties. If they, like this guy, when he comes into, your, into a room, when you see him, you have to get on your hands and knees. Nobody's allowed to speak to him. In fact, all the Commodores are like that. When you need to speak to somebody in uniform, you have to speak like this. But this guy does it more than anybody else. Even if, even if he's not speaking to you, you still have to crash down. And um, if you do something wrong, this is how it beats people. You have to, and it gets a stick. And your nails, you. breaks your nails. Oh, it's horrible what this guy, what this guy does. He's a sadist. I mean, this guy is, is, is a lunatic. He's not a nice person at all. There was one time, they were, he's, they were playing football and they kicked the ball and he landed on his, in his office on the roof. And this guy came out foaming at the mouth, screaming. And I was appalled. I was like, wow. I've heard about this guy's reputation, but this was the first time I actually saw him in action. And then um, they moved the guy to the wing that I was in, and everybody wanted to move away from the guy. It, it, this, is, this is every, I think every month, the wing that he was in, they would do, they would do a building five move. Now, People who hear about a Building 5 move is coming and they'll be on their best behaviour because nobody wants to get moved to that wing because of this guy's reputation. In, in the morning, when it's sunny, during the assembly, he will be on the mic, in the shade, speaking for about an hour and everybody else will be on the ground in the sun. Mm. And he talks about nonsense. <laughs> so this guy moved to Adan. Everybody is planning to move to the other place. So I was one of those people. And this guy likes people with money. He likes foreigners because what he will do, he'll get a room and he'll say, this room is a VIP room, but you have to pay to get into the VIP. But you sleep like a king. There will only be about maybe 20 people in there. You'll have a big bed space. You know, you'll be, you know, everything's like, but you have to pay an initial fee and then every month you have to pay as well and it's not cheap so this is this is what this guy does how much are we talking for a decent stay in the vrp room 
maybe about 40 pounds to start with to an issue money, fee and then every month but everything's in coffees like you get a sachet of coffee is like five baht so you might say a hundred coffees or 200 coffees and then every month you have to pay him another maybe 50 coffees every month so he uses and that's currency he can he can move that into 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 money and then um When we wake up in the morning, we get out of bed and we start our day with Koro Snacks. Koro is a healthy snacks brand focusing on bringing additive-free natural ingredients to their customers with fair prices in bulk packaging. They have everything from nut butters to free from baking ingredients to cooking essentials and, of course, the snacks. Look what's in this gem. It's the vegan power mix from Koro. So we have a mixture of nut kernels, dried fruit, Cacao nibs, soy crispies, and hemp seed Ooh. hold. What are these little red ones? Hey. Look at this thing. Mmm. Mmm. That's good. Fresh and healthy. So what makes Coro special in comparison to others? Coro's quality management team carefully and regularly reviews the quality of their products. For a 5% discount on Coro's products, use the code TRUECRIME with no space in between true and crime. The link to Coro's online shop is in the description box on YouTube. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. I asked to move and he likes people with money. So he initially said, no, I can't move. And then he called us. He called all the foreigners. He said, I want you guys to be careful. You guys, you hear? There's many of us, there's only a little few of you, so you best be on your best behavior because if you do something wrong, my boys will beat you. And if you want to go home with your legs and your arms together, you be on your best behavior. And, and I've seen him beat foreigners. He had an altercation with a, an African guy, some guy from Nigeria, and he, he moved him back to this dad and he came. And he asked this guy called Kevin, he asked him some questions and Kevin ignored him. And um, so he targeted Kevin, he said, oh, get that cup. And somebody came to get the cup of Kevin and Kevin ran to him to speak to him and his boys just jumped on Kevin, beat him up. I didn't see it, but that's what happened. I can see all cuts and bruises on this guy as well. So he was taken upstairs for about a week, just locked up upstairs and um, the next time I asked to move he moved me so I moved to a really more relaxed um, place and then you go to court every I think it must be every six or seven weeks you just go to court you say no, I'm not plead not guilty you go back but it's like it's kind of like a day out which is you welcome it but they put chains on you and you have to be careful, these chains, they bang it on you. And if the people don't like you, they, they, the hammer can easily slip. I take it you didn't have legal representation. Oh, this guy actually ripped my family off. My family kind of raised um, 5,000 pounds. And um, he came to me and said, um, my fee's 100,000, which is about 2,000 pounds. And he said to me, oh, we're gonna pay the police to, drop the, the the amount of grams that I've got down. So I said, yeah, okay. So he comes back and say, oh, D, we, uh, the police, we can't do it because your case is big. Uh, Bangkok police are involved. I said, what are you talking about? I've only got 20 grams of ice. I'm not a big time dealer, but I said, are you gonna give my money back? He said, yeah. See this guy, every time he come to see me, he upset me. <laughs> I'm gonna kill him. And then in the end, when I actually finally went to court on the last day, I said, did you cut the grams? He said, yeah. I said, how much, how much? He said, 18 grams. I said, you're a liar. And then when the judge came out, I said, Your Honor, this man is a liar and a cheat. I don't want him representing me anymore. And then um, he sort of, I gave the phone to my son, called my son. I said, look, he's going to give you back 100,000 back. And this guy got 100,000 for literally doing nothing. All he did was come and see me for five minutes, buy me 500 baht worth of food, 
and, and, and that was it. And then on the last day I went to court, they said to me, how do you plead? Your sentence is 20 years and uh, with a fine of five, which is about 10,000, 10,000 pounds. I said, if you plead guilty today, we'll half that. If you plead not guilty, we'll give you the 20 years. I said, I'm guilty. So they gave me 10 years and eight months. And, um, and you know, when you get that, you kind of think, okay, I know where I'm at now. You know, I can start dealing with counting, counting down. And, um, and at this, at this point, you start learning how you're going to get out. People start telling you about how the king gives pardons and, um, and what the time when I went inside actually was, it kind of was a good time because they were changing laws. Before I got there, they changed the importation laws because people, there was one girl, she had one pill traveling from Cambodia to Thailand. She had one pill of Yaba that they gave her 35 years. And then there was this, another girl, an I society girl, she had not even a line of cocaine, but because she came from Vietnam to Thailand, they gave her 35 years. Wow. And there's a big outcry thinking, no. It, so they changed that law. And then the next law that was gonna be changed is the drug law. So people were saying, D, don't worry, the new drug law's coming, it's coming, you know. The, and then the king, when I got inside, the king had just died. So they had no, they had no king for about two years, and they had no amnesty for two years. So they're saying, "D, look, it's going to be a big amnesty. Don't worry. Just get your get your sentence and get your red uh, get your uh, your red card. Yeah, get your red card in. So you get sentenced. Then forty eight days after your red card comes, that forty eight days is for you to appeal or for the prosecutor to appeal." After those 48 days, then you're on normal class. So six months after being on normal class, you get onto good class. Six months after being on good class, you get onto very good class. Six months after being on very good class, you get to excellent class. And this is where the big, this is where you get a lot of time off. But when it comes to drugs, when it comes to pedophilia, rapist, human traffickers, fraudsters, um, bank robbers, murderers. When they get to excellent class, they get half of their sentence. So, but a drug person, if you've got eight years or more, you only get one-sixth of your sentence. So, you know, and 85% of the prisoners in that prison are in there for drugs and they repeat offenders. It's not their first time of being there. And let's say, for example, my first offense, I get two years. If I get arrested a year after I come out of prison and I get charged with something else, they will give me half, they will give me for what? They will give me a sentence for my next crime and they'll give me half of what I got before on top of the, the new one. So people are going in for a lot more sentences and, um, and I think their government wanted to address that but it took six or seven years before that came in it, that only came in it actually they called me a week oh, a few days before I went home and said to me uh, for resentencing but for the last year it was really exciting times in the prison because a lot of people were anticipating a lot of time off from their sentences and what they did in the new law no matter how much drugs you've got you can only get 15 years no matter how much but there's a catch you get an extra five years if you get caught dealing so let's say you've got a kilo people like with a kilo you think oh you're only going to get 15 years but a kilo is like it's for selling so they give you an extra five years uh, that's, so that's 20 years. And if it depends on what kind of dealing you're doing, you can even get more time. So that was kind of like a little bit disappointing. Um, but before that, I just talk about my experience in that other wing. Um, 
I managed to, yeah, because uh, people send me money, I was able to buy a bed space. Um, like, because the room that I was in, let's say from here to there, is for foreigners, and only foreigners stay there. So if there's like only three foreigners in the prison in that wing, they will stay in that area, and ties will join in as well. But if there's 50 foreigners, they'll stay in that, in that corner. There's no other room. So I was forced to give the room boss, because every, every room has a room boss with a Thai person who's in charge. And I think I gave him about, I think it was 2,000 baht, which is about 20 quid or 30 quid. So he put me up on the top on a wooden bed next to the window. And I put myself a fan because it's, it's roasting in there really, really hot. So I was able to kind of live a little bit better. And um, with the money that my family and friends were sending, I was able to buy food. I was able to have somebody who's going to do run it, wash my clothes, fetch my food, because you need this in a Thai jail. Thais can get things done. You, you just let the Thais do it for a little bit of money. So, and then coffees. Coffees is like um, currency. So I was able to hold coffees. I think I had about 2,000 coffees. So that's about 10,000 baht, which is about 200 pounds. And I was let, I was like having a coffee business. So any foreign, if foreigners want to borrow coffee, you can't do it with ties. If ties come to you and say like, oh, can I borrow 50 coffees? I pay. If you do it, you're not, you're not going to get your coffees back. <laughs> no matter what you do, you're not going to get it back. But so for, for foreigners, yeah, I was able to give them 50 coffees and get five back. 10 coffees, get 10 back. So, and at that time, there were cigarettes. Uh, they banned the cigarettes from in the prison. And um, they were sneaking in tobacco that cost 10, 10 back outside. Let's say, for example, it cost 10 pence outside to buy in the shop. But when it comes to the prison, it's like 10 pounds. So a lot of people still want to smoke. So they come to me, borrow coffee. I borrow them coffees and they'll buy their smokes. And then when they get their money, I get paid back. And um, yeah, that was another way of surviving and uh, in, in there. And um, yeah, what else happened in there? My friend, my friend Mario from America, I watched him die of oh. HIV. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mario, Mario came specifically to Thailand for, for ladyboys. And uh, one of the ladyboys that he was seeing grasped him up. And he only had, I think he only had one gram of ice. And then the lawyers and English people as well, because they just extorted his mother. They just, oh yeah, we can get him off. Give us this money. She sold her house. She, I mean, she, it was so sad, really. I still, I feel sad for Mario, really, because he's, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. What happened to him and his family, he didn't really, he couldn't believe why he was there. You know, he couldn't, he couldn't come to terms with why he's sitting there because he's got one gram of, 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 of ice. And, um, I think he was in a little bit of denial. He said he hasn't got HIV, but, and then when he did, they didn't give him his medicine. And then um, they moved him from, because he sat with me every day for two years. He, because I, ha I had a house and every foreigner, I was like one of the longest foreigners there. I've established myself after a couple of years. So if a foreigner moves to, the, to my building, they'll come and sit with me. So I had, I had a house already and this guy sat with me, you know, um, every day. And then one day they moved him to the hospital and um, I had to go to the hospital one day. And that's another thing. If you want to go to the hospital, you, you can't. You, you ask the, the commodores, you ask the prisoners because the prisoners run everything. They say, no, you cannot. So you have to wait for the embassy to come and tell the embassy, look, I need to see the doctor. So the embassy will then write a letter to the prison, and then the doctor will see you. See you. So I saw Mario, they, he was in nappy. He was in a diaper. They, he was sleeping on the bed like this. They just ignored him. And he, I said, oh, Mario, fuck. What happened to you? Oh, oh, water. 
water. He wanted water. Gave him, gave him water. He drank it and then spewed it up. And what came out of his mouth, man, was this green stuff. And, uh, and then, um, and then he died, man. Wow. He died. And, and, and what happens is, you know, during the day, they have this, this tannoy. You hear, dun, dun. And when you hear it first time, they te- they're, t- they're saying, this so, 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 and so is going home today. But if you hear that ding dong, the ne- the, twice that day, that means somebody's died. So I heard, bang, bang, Mario Olovario. They said it in Thai, and I knew what happened. I knew he'd gone. I knew he'd died. And it was so sad, man. I still remember this guy till today. How old was he? Forties. So young. Yes. Yes. It kind of reminds me of what David McMillan said when he was escaping, and he looked over at the hospital, and he could see all the faces of the people, but they couldn't speak. They were so weak. Yeah. They're all, they're all dying. Yeah. Yeah. Tuberculosis is rife there. HIV is rife. I saw, I saw another lady boy die. I mean, this lady boy, when I first moved into the prison, she was full of life. She was the life and soul of everywhere. You know, very popular person. And then one day they moved her from the hospital to, it, she was sitting near my house. And I'm, I'm looking at this person. And someone said, yeah, you know, that's blah, blah, blah. For and she, she, she went as well. She died. Yeah. The hospital is not a nice place to, to be, man. Yeah, because they don't, they don't care. They really, really don't care. But if you've got money, you can, you can buy whatever you need there. And then I talked a little bit about this um, new drug law thing. You know, it'll come on TV and everybody will be happy. I mean, you know, we don't speak Thai because t- the television is all Thai. And you, you don't watch um, live TV. Everything's pre-recorded and they use a USB. And um, the Minister of Justice will come up, will come on and talk. And, uh, and it, was an, it was exciting times for the, for the prison, you know, because we can, like, for, for, ex, for example, a year before I was going on, everybody was saying that, like, D, when this new drug law comes out, you're definitely going on because you've done your time. You've done more than what they're going to... Because everybody's thinking, all right, the amount of drugs they're going to get, the amount of sentence you're going to get is 15 years. So I've got 10 years. I've already done four or five. So when it comes, when the new drug law comes for the amount of drugs that I've got, they're only going to give me seven years, not 10 years. So I've already done that time. So I'll go home. But it didn't, it didn't work out like that. Um, the... December the 10th, the only, the only people that it benefited were people who were getting sentenced, new people. There was a guy, he was the number one trustee there. He's actually my friend. He helped me fill out my um, resentencing shit. I had, to pay, I had to pay for it, but he wrote mine with ease. So we were going to be one of the first people to get resentenced, and he was actually the first person to get resentenced. And um, on the morning of re- resentencing, he was giving out all this stuff to people, hugs and that. You know, you're definitely going home. Blah blah blah. And um, in the afternoon, he, he came back. I was thinking, what the, f- whoa, what happened? And um, he didn't. It didn't favor people who'd already been sentenced. He only favored new people. So, for example, if somebody had 18 grams of ice, that same as me, what I had, he will only get seven years. He'll accept three and a half years. But I was 10, de- I think uh, the month that I was going to go home anyway, I was going home in about a week or 10 days, and they called me for resentencing. I thought, wow, okay. But I kind of knew that nothing would happen. And when I got there, they said, nothing's going to happen, but you can appeal. You got a chance to appeal, but I just didn't bother because I was, I was going on anyway. And um, yeah, COVID was kind of like a difficult time in that prison. I caught it and it was horrendous. It was horrible. It, you know, I, I got very sick. 
Um, I had a fever, you know, and what they gave us actually, what they gave us, I can't even remember the name of it, but it, they gave us these local herbs to treat COVID. Really? And, um, yeah. You have to take 10 of them and uh, it didn't work. <laughs> it, it didn't work. But what they actually did, they gave, they gave every prisoner the COVID injection. Um, yeah, they gave it to everybody. So I've, I got three COVID jabs um, before, and I caught it again, actually, but it wasn't as severe as it was the first time. And, um, and towards the end of my sentence, you get, you have to be in isolation for 10 days. And I got into isolation and that was, uh, that was okay. Oh, oh, let me just talk about what my day will consist of. I was about to ask you that. Right. So they will come in, the doors will be open at 6.30 and, um, and towards the end, because I was, you know, I can go and shower with the big boys. I mean, you know, at the back, I don't need to wait for them. I shower with a bucket and, and one of these. Everybody else have to wait for the shower. So I'll quickly shower, quickly have something to eat. My, my boy will give me my food, help me out to do what, whatever I need to do. And then there will be counting. No, before counting, 6.30, it's breakfast. And um, it's horrendous, actually. The food, I didn't talk about the food. The food, what you get is water, cabbage. Nice. Water and cabbage every day. Every day, you might, if you're lucky, you get a little bit of chicken. Well, what the rice with the maggots in it? Yeah, yeah, well, we were lucky actually. When I first got in there, there were stones in the, in the rice. What? You, oh, stop. Yeah. Stop. I kid you not, there's stones in the rice. Yeah, I could not believe this. You buy into stones in, in your food. Is so that- you, you have to buy your own food. Is that a deliberate effort? I don't know. In, they, they get the worst stuff, don't they? The prisoners, they get given, even in, in this country, they get given the worst food. So, oh. so and the food is served on the, flo- on the floor. So it's like rows and rows. The food for a thousand people, so you can imagine, it's like from down the road all the way up here in rows like this. In rows like this. So everybody queues up gets their tray and there's no seating you can't see it you sit on the floor to eat and um you eat you put your you put your stuff away and then there's um assembly where they do counting they're forever counting they count about three or four times a day and then they do the counting and then after that it's free time and then i'm able to go to the gym that's what kept me going in there they had weights and uh, i was able to train uh, the afternoon, all the foreigners, we all read um, because the TV, you can't understand it. So you have to, you have to read. And, um, and then in the evening, lights out at nine o'clock and then you wake up at 6.30 again. And that's like every day. And then I sat on a concrete wall for like this because he had a um, bar. So I put a guy, one of the guys that used to, Thai guy that used to work for me before, he went home and then I think a month later, two months later, he come back again. And he told me like he was looking at me from the other building and he can see me still sitting like this. He laughs at me. <laughs> I sat like this for five years <laughs> in the same place on a concrete wall. So- um, You said you ended up reading my book, Hard Time in there. How did that come about? It, there's loads of books there, loads of foreign books. So the embassy would bring books in, um, family members will bring books in for you, so everything that's get brought in gets left there. Were you doing Did, anything with prisoners abroad? Because I donated yeah. a load of, of them yeah, to prisoners yeah, abroad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did a lot with prisoners abroad. They helped us actually. Without them, most prisoners won't be able to survive. You don't in, just because uh, you got to pay for your medical, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Like in America, at least it's hard yeah. to get anything. But. It's hard to get to get stuff. So, yeah. but once you have your embassy and the prisoners abroad behind you, the prisoners will bend. The prison will bend over and make sure you get what you need, uh, because they need to have that good relationship. We can, even though you don't want to do it, you can complain. But if you complain to the embassy and it gets back to the prison, he, he, he told, I mean, they told it to one of a foreigner, an American guy said, look, 
you see your embassy once a month, we have you. Uh, no, t once every two, three months, and we have you every day. So be careful um, what, what you're doing. Uh, one, <laughs> a friend of mine from Algeria, he got caught smoking, and one Commodore saw him smoking, but didn't know where he hid the cigarette. He's looking, looking, looking. And one prisoner said, look, it's over there. A Thai prisoner said, look, it's over there. So the Commodore went and got it. And the Algerian guy, went too happy, went to the Thai guy. Said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, do that. And the Thai guy went and told the, the Commodore. And the Commodore, the next day, during assembly, Kareem, stand up. So you going to beat him up, yeah? That was he, he, he was marked in the shower. They, they beat him up. They beat him up. And um, he's lying there on the floor. And I liked Karim. I, I was the one who went up there. Karim, get up, man. Because they don't care about you. you you're just going to lie there all day. Nobody's going to come and say anything. He managed to get himself up. Oh, I, and they won't let him go outside to get his wound treated. They won't, <laughs> But he wants to fight this Commodore. I'm saying, Kareem, you cannot fight these people. You don't, you don't have an embassy. You don't get any visits. You know, there's nothing you can do. You just have to let this go. But he, he find it hard to let it go. It, it, it really hurt him. It was really humiliating. He could have got killed, though, couldn't yeah, he? Yeah, he could have done. I said, look, you can't win. But in the end, they moved him to, to Bangkok. Did you get any visitors while you were in there? Yeah. Before the pandemic, before the COVID come out, I, I had my friend Gary, and Nigel and Simon, who actually lived in Pattaya. So they took it. Every two weeks, I'll get a visit. One person will come one week and another one will come the following week. So, and that, that was quite nice, actually, because that keeps you going in prison. Without that, without, you know, without visits, without money, without somebody sending you books, letters and that, you... It's not a nice place to be. Were your visitors allowed to bring anything in for you? Only books, but they'll have to leave it at the gate. So only books. They can't bring in food or anything like that. They can leave money in your account and just a couple of books. But the visits, that we, they have um, special visits twice a year or three times a year before the um, COVID. And this visit is just like sitting down like this. It's planned. So three or four people can come, physically come into the prison, sit down in front of you. You talk to them for about an hour, 45 minutes, and then they, they, they go again. It was usually the visits behind Perspex? Yeah, it's on the phone. Yeah. yeah. And then that, because of COVID, they won't let anyone in the prison. And then it was on um, virtual. Uh, it's kind of like, what's up? Yeah. So video, video telephone. So they, they call you at 15 minutes. You talk to someone for 15 minutes. And then that, that was it. And that keeps you going to get that. So over time then, you got off the floor into your own sleeping quarters. You, people sending you money so you could buy better food. Mm. What, what kind of food did you concentrate on buying? And how, what's the mechanics of buying the food? It's, it's limited. Like, it, like before, there's a menu. So you can get chicken and rice. I mean, it's quite a big chicken, actually, to be fair. The food that's at that side is worth buying. So you're only limited in buying Thai. Thai. Oh, before, you used to be able to get a hamburger. Um, yeah, you can get pizza on a Friday. Um, you can buy chicken. All oh, these are treats. And only people with money can do this. Um, so, but the basis you can rice is rice and chicken. Um, pork and rice, um, sticky rice, pork on the stick. So there's a variety of, of things you can buy. And then they brought in, and then they bought, they had a shop, because initially everything was bought outside. You have, to, you have to have somebody to do this for you. Like and a guard would do it? No, another prisoner would do it. That can speak English and Thai, so he write it all down in Thai. They will take the money out of your account anyway. You have to remember your number. So you write your number on the thing and then that gets taken out. Two days later, three days later, you get that food. So every three days you get new food for three days. 
But and then eventually they, everything was computerized where you can actually buy stuff and take it away that day. That's the dry stuff, but the, the wet stuff, you have to wait one day. You have to order it a day before and then the next day you, you, you get it. Water, Coca-Cola, pizza, like I said before, uh, French fries, chicken. Um, now and again, they have special menu where you can order KFC, fish. And then now and again, this is money making as well. They, they have a market in the prison. People from outside will come and um, it's a bit expensive, but it's a treat. So it'll be a big market. So you'll be able to go out and buy all stuff that you can't normally buy in the prison. We hope you're enjoying the podcast. This is a word from our sponsor. Jen, it's that time of the year when people are stuffing themselves with food and the sun's not out and vitamin deficiencies occur. You said that you were on some vitamins, but you were overdosing yourself. I honestly was taking up to 10 tablets a day, not knowing if they were giving me any health benefits at all. So no, finding Vital has proved absolute wonders for me. Fill in a short online consultation about your diet, health goals and lifestyle and Vital will create a tailored made pack just for you. To get a free two week trial of personalized vitamins, head to vitl.com and use the code Sean, S-H-A-U-N at checkout. Link is in the description box below this video. So Jen, how easy is the Vital website to use? So with a few simple steps, it can tell you what you are lacking in nutrients. So for me, it was my skin, sleep and stress. <laughs> so mm. now after four days of use, I'm already seeing an improvement. So well done, Vital. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Now back to the podcast. I never heard of a prison having a market. Yeah. What about That's religion cool. in prison? Oh, Buddhists, I mean, but yeah, they cater, they cater for Muslims, yeah. They can, they, the Muslims can, um, during Ramadan, they have one room, so they'll all be, <laughs> funny you said that actually, but they sell their chicken. <laughs> <laughs> no, during Ramadan, the, the tough guys from the Muslim will take all the chicken and give a little bit. The next day, you're able to buy chicken for coffee. You know, it's highly illegal. But it's survivor of the fittest, survivor of the toughest. You know, all the top guys, they will take all the chicken and then they'll sell it the next day. Um, and foreigners suffer. You don't get, like a foreigner will say, oh yeah, I'm a Muslim. They'll go in there and they don't get nothing. So the next year they don't bother going because they know what's going to happen. The ties are not going to give them anything. What's the main religion then? Is it Buddhism? Buddhism, yeah. Mm. Buddhism. So, but you're not forced to do, you're not forced to pray in the afternoon. A, something will come up, the Buddha will come and everybody will pray. But if you're in that other guy's building, whether you're a Buddhist or not, you still have to sit like this. But in the other buildings, the Commodore is not that strict. It, if you're not, you don't have to do it. But that other guy, oh my God. Ah, I forgot about this story. Huh. This one's interesting. Some guy went to court. This was when the cigarettes was banned. This guy goes to court, swallows cigarette. Somebody seen him and told that Commodore. So the Commodore gave him laxatives. And the thing weren't coming out. And in the, mid in the middle of the assembly, he had this guy crouch down. He had a lady boy putting his hand up there trying to, I kid you not, this is this 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 oh. this guy is a sadist man. And he showed it on TV. I mean would, everybody watched it. Would the acid in your stomach not dissolve a cigarette end? Well, I mean so I he's, he's he put it in a plastic. Wrapped, 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 yeah, wrapped, he wrapped it, he wrapped it up. He wrapped it up. But this guy is not a good guy. I no. mean he's a guy that will sell trainers like, like trainers. I bought trainers in there for training, so he will buy trainers and one day he'll just decide nobody's allowed to wear trainers anymore. He'll go and collect everybody's trainers and throw them away. A month later, if you want to buy trainers, he's 30 coffees, 40 coffees, then he sells your trainers again. This guy is there to make money. That's what he does. He just, but to be fair on the guy, the only good thing he does, he put, he treats people in that wing during the Thai festivals. He will make sure his parties 
a big parties. Parties? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Explain With music, a party. DJs. Um, <laughs> like during song so crime. In the prison, music yeah, and yeah, DJs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thai New Year. During Thai New Year, he'll, he'll get a DJ and he'll have food. He'll buy, he'll buy lots of special stuff where there'll be competitions to win the stuff and he'll give some stuff away. But it's taking money all the way through the year to be able to do this. And that's the, one of the good things that, that's one of the only good things that he does. But my building chief, he doesn't take money, he doesn't want bribes, so he'll be quiet, there'll be nothing. But he's building, oh God, I he, think he I, takes I, care. I think I'd rather take the not giving away money yeah, all year yeah, than yeah. what a party wants. And you bring a DJ and it'd be a special DJ. What kind of music? Ah, oh, Thai music. Thai music. Yeah, yeah. Any Thai, good? Thai. No. <laughs> noise. <laughs> all it is is, is noise. <laughs> <laughs> noise. Have you ever heard anything like that? No. Yeah. No? Yeah. It's just bizarre, isn't it? Yeah, like, he's, he's such a cool man all year. Yeah, yeah this man's horrible. He really is. He, he, he's bad. He's a bad person really bad person so we had a podcast guest on talked about the ties putting jewelry in the penises oh, yeah. <laughs> what yes have you heard about this Jen? yes no. i mean this is this is something that you cannot fathom you cannot believe <laughs> you, this is gonna blow they inject vaseline and it's like a bell it's like a bell like this you, the bottom bit is this big like this and it's like a bell, it swings. You don't get rings that much, but what you do get a lot is silicone. And, and oh, no, it's, you know, like ball bearings. Ball bearings, that's yeah. what the person told us. Yeah, they slit the thing open and um, they put a ball bearing in there and then it just heals back up again. And some people have five or six in there. And the purpose of doing that in prison is what? Show enough. Oh, I've got, I've got, oh, oh, oh. I've got metal in my Yeah, that's area. what they, they like that shit. And this what oh. are you showing it off to other men? It's yeah. like <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, a guy gets a Prince Albert, he's trying to impress a, a, a woman. He's impressing all the other guys. <laughs> he's impressing all the other guys. That would impress and me. you can get into trouble for it. I mean, you know, <laughs> some people it goes wrong. It like goes what? gangrene. Gangrene. Yes. So the prison don't like it. I mean, now that someone, somebody gets punished really bad. You get, you can get punished for two months, three months, every day exercise. The punishment, like, let's say for example, when you first come into the prison, you do exercise for one month. And then when you get moved to another building, you do exercise for another month. Foreigners are exempt from this. But if you get into trouble, depending on what trouble, it, that, this is the worst one you can do. Oh, the worst one, stabbing or killing somebody or, or doing this, this penis thing. <laughs> and um, for three months, you'll exercise every day, Monday to Friday. Imagine. What kind of and, exercise? Oh, squats, <laughs> jumping jacks. Just normal exercise, oh but God. you're doing it in the sun. You know, you, you, oh, another thing they do, they roll on the ground. They roll, well, just just rolling from one end of the hall to the other end and roll back. And, and it's other prisoners who's telling them to do this. They're called the black shirts. They're the ones who, for the ties, if, you, if you're a tie and you do something wrong, they can get you to do a hundred squats and you have to do it. But a foreigner, I just tell them to fuck. <laughs> they won't even bother asking you to do. Is, is the like you know like when you go in a prison and they give you like a rule book or they tell you there's all these rules is is there a, a, they only a, give it to the ties they only tell the rules to the ties but you have to learn you have to follow what the ties are doing you have to make sure you keep your eye out to know what i mean there was a guy an english guy who he doesn't want to listen but you know he'll go and shower in the sink you know, something that doesn't make sense, you know. I just say, why are you doing that? You see anybody? But he'd get punished. He'll get punished for it. And um, the worst thing that can happen to a prisoner, if you do something wrong on this wing, you get sent to that man's wing. Mm. It's the, you know, because he's going to punish you over there as well. Um, Did you violate any rules by accident or otherwise? Yeah, but nobody really. Well, what did I do that was kind of... 
well, things like showering when I'm not supposed to shower and things like that. But you just you pay tithes to do that, so they just keep a they just keep a blind eye because the tithes are the ones who are running the prison. So depends on how long you've been there and how much money you have. Depends on how influence you have. So I was quite liked. I can do kind of whatever I liked, really, so, to a certain extent. And the Commodores weren't more lenient on you, foreign folks? Yeah, they have to be. They can't be foreigners. Mm. They can't be foreigners. It, see, if I had reported what happened to me, to the Commodore, those people, they would try to find out what happened, who did it, and, and they'll be severely punished because they can't have the embassy. They can't have me complaining to the embassy that I was beating up. They, they, would, they would get into trouble, you know, so... What is the worst punishment you've seen a Commodore dish out? I suppose it's, it's this thing here. With the fingernails? Yeah. And then getting put in the ladyboy room, which which nobody wants to go in there. Yeah. <laughs> this idea. this African guy. I mean, they, like, the thing like, let's show me your penis and that before you go in the ladyboy room. They won't do it to a foreigner, but they, what, they'll make sure you don't sleep well that you don't sleep right. However, if you've got money and you get put into the ladyboy room, you just say, how much is it going to cost me? And they will just charge you, they'll give you a bed. But tires can't do that. So foreigners who get punished can, can kind of um, do that. It's one of the most breathtaking stories we've had on the channel was David McMillan's prison escape. Yeah. I don't know if you had his, uh, have you heard about this. Yeah, I read his book and I watched his podcast, the, the one you did. What did you think about his escape? I think he was daring. Yeah, he's one of the he's the only one to 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 have done it, really. And at the time when he was there, things were a lot more laxed. You know, you can get things brought in. You could people can sneak. You can get food brought in. You know, it was a lot more and. Um, it's not like that now. Was there yeah. a, a thing called Mars Bar Creek at the time you went there? Well, all the poo was, the sewage. Yeah. Well, it's, the water, <laughs> the water you actually you use for bathing yourself is black. Oh. It, yes. It's horrible. It's not clean water. Some, sometimes you go, because in the toilet, You've got sections that has the water there. And when you go there, it's black. So it's the same water you're showering with. Yeah. Well, and you get people who would brush their teeth and... Not once did I put water in my mouth after I brushed my teeth. What water were you Not drinking? Not unless it's um, tap water. Tap water you would Yeah, drinking. you can buy water. And the good thing about Red Cross came in there. Before I went in there... People, foreigners told me that were in there before me, before the Red Cross came, that the water you have to fight for. So you have to pay a Thai person in the morning want to run and fight to get two, two um, bottles of water. And before you can do anything with it, you have to put it down and let the thing settle first because oh, the there's things crawling around. Oh, the insects, it. what's the insects like? Yeah. <laughs> and I'll tell you, uh, one, one minute, I'll tell you another story. And then, um, yeah, and then you boil it and then they drink it. And then the Red Cross came and they put filters in the drinking water. So you can actually drink that. But the, the water that you wash with is very dirty. And um, I'll tell you about this thing that you can catch. It's called fee. And what, what it is, is... There'll be an insect, like it'll burrow into your skin. And the more it goes in, it swells up. And it could be this big. Well, a guy had one in his there. And there's about five things living there, like worms. Oh. And what they do, the way they treat it, is they have to cut it. They have to wait. And then they have to cut it. And then they have to get these things out. And it, there's a hole. So they get like toilet paper, like this. Like this. They roll it like this. Mm. 
Yes, you got the idea. Yeah, dip it in iodine and then push it down. Into so the... It, it, could be, it, it could be this long. They push it down, push it down with iodine. They, oh, this has got iodine. And then in the afternoon, when you go back, they pull it out. Oh, it's one of the most disgusting things you'll ever see. Fee is called, and I'm so happy that I didn't catch it. It's the oh worst thing you can God. catch in there. And you can get it all, you can get it here. You can get it, so a guy had it here. You can get it on your back. Where the, it, you're scarred for life. You're scarred for life. It's the most horrible thing. You, and you can't walk and it hurts. It's painful, really painful. And there's nothing, there's no treatment for it. I don't, nobody knows what causes it. Do any, nobody. Any bugs visit you in the night? The cockroaches. Yes. Mm. Where I sleep actually is near the window and, I, and there's, it gets dark, there's thousands of cockroaches. And now and again, one, you have to, Brush one off your face. Are you scared? And this is horrible, horrible, horrible. Cockroaches, yeah, they do come. They come. And they walk over people in the night. And a few have been over me. Yeah. Yeah, scary. Did you ever fantasize about escape? No. Mm. You fantasize, but it's impossible. You just, just forget about it. The only time you might think it's possible, like I said before, is when you go to the hospital. Because you is outside, but you have chains on, mm. and um, but you have to be on the motorbike. So, but you can't do it from the prison. You can't, you, you know. But like I said the American guy did it, and he got away. He got away, and but they killed him when he got to the border. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I think Macmillan said people would get, they would mangle people's legs and stuff yeah, if they yeah. caught them. Yeah. Some of those usually really sh shoot at their legs. Just beat them. They yeah, just beat, beat yeah. Beat them. Break all the bones yeah, so they're they all mangled. Break all the bones, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it, it, it's like they lose face. If anybody escapes, they, 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 they lose face. It's really bad because, you know, it means they're not doing their job properly, their jobs properly. And they don't. The Commodores don't work. They just stay in their air-conditioned office all day. And the prisoners do the work. The black shirts run the prison. You've just been released, Dee, and you've got a very happy disposition. How did you maintain your spirit throughout this? Family and friends. Knowing my family were behind me. Knowing my friends was behind me. Knowing Narcotics Anonymous was behind me because I had a friend who contacted all my friends and they put my, they, you know, they all chipped in and make sure I was looked after. That kept me going. Mm. You know, was the was there a low moments when you contemplated, you know, doing uh, anything? You know, I don't know why I don't think about this. When my dad died, you know, I was told my dad died in there, you know, and that was, um, yeah, that was a sad time. But you can't show that. But when something like that happens, how do they announce it to you? Uh, the embassy came. Uh -huh. Yeah, the embassy came and told me, and um, yeah, that was a sad part. But you, you can't cry. And you can't really tell any. Anyway, it's only one or two people you can tell, like one of the, one or two English people that you know that you you mixed with, and there's nothing they can really do. Oh, sorry to hear that, and that's it. They go about their business, and you're left with you know dealing with it because everybody else has got their own shit to deal with. Had you been able to communicate with your dad before that? No, we we didn't really have a we didn't have a good relationship, you know me and my dad so but it doesn't mean i didn't love him and it doesn't mean that like, he didn't love me you know it, but it's just how how it was do you appreciate things now more family more yeah family more i was like me i was like a happy-go-lucky person you know go anywhere i want do anything i want but now it shows to me like now family is the most important without family you you're nothing man because at the end of the day, it was my family that were there for me. I've got a son, I've got a 31 year old son. I mean, and his mom were really supportive from, from the gecko from day one until I come out. Mm. So I'm really grateful for them, my son and his mother. So how were you feeling in the days leading up to your release? <laughs> yeah, happy. 
<laughs> <laughs> happy, you know, I was, uh, but also apprehensive, you know, because you hear about people getting gate arrested. You know, you, you hear this stuff and you, you don't know what, you know, what you've done in the past, you know. So, but I was happy. And um, I kind of talk about 10 days before you, you're released, you're put in a room because of COVID, they isolate you for 10 days. So you don't take COVID outside. And um, so that, that, was, that was kind of cool. And then on the day of my release, they kind of just open up the, you know, everybody saying goodbye, you're hugging people, you're saying goodbye, you're happy, you're smiling. And you can't wait to get, you can't wait to get out. But what happens to foreigners is they don't get let out like that. We have to, they will let us out of the building and then you go to the main office and then you wait for the police to come. And is that where you go into the immigration holding cells? Yeah, before that, before you go to the IDC, you go to the police station, you go to one police station, they will check to make sure that there's no warrant out for your arrest. Once that's done, and that was, I mean, I was in, at this police station, not even 45 minutes. Then they moved us to the arresting, the charging police station. So we stayed there, you stay there, and then the immigration will come. And then immigration only comes every Friday. So let's say you get released on a Monday, you have to wait for till Friday. And the police station is not a, it's not a nice place. What's it like? Uh, it's horrible, horrible. So the worst time you can stay there is like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, where they, you know, Pattaya, where you are, they arrest drunks, they arrest foreigners, they are. Oh. So it's very noisy, very dirty, like very dirty, very dirty. But if you have people visiting you, they can buy you food from outside, so you can, buy KFC, you can buy McDonald's, you can, you know, you can kind of treat yourself. And then, um, but the worst part of my prison sentence actually was the IDC because it's overcrowded and they don't let you go outside for exercise. Is that immigration detention center? Yeah. And then because of COVID, they, they had three IDCs. The first one that we went to was in a, in a sports hall and, uh, it, and it was run by other foreigners, Cambodians, Laoans, and some Thais. And these guys were horrible. Now, let's say you're a foreigner that is, hasn't got any money or hasn't got an embassy. And I saw this, they'll beat you every day I mean, I mean it's bad I mean when I mean a kicking they give you a kicking and then make sure they subdue you when you think like it's over it's not over they'll keep kicking you and kicking you and kicking you I mean this was this was horrible to see I watched this happen I think whoa whoa slap punch kick and um, so they did that to subdue everybody else. So when you see that, you just have to be on your best behavior because that could potentially happen to you. So, and I saw them be many people in there, many people. And then they moved us to the worst bit, actually, where it's like another prison, but there's no prison guards. So, and then you don't exercise, you don't go outside. So there's been people who have been there four years in that room and they don't go outside and exercise. And they kind of run the room. They're like the leader of the room. So I was in this place from, I think it was Friday. And then on the Monday, my flight was on the Monday. So I was there Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then on the Monday, I went to the regular IDC because my flight wasn't until about one o'clock. I see in the in movies the there's sort of women and children in these things. Is, is that correct? Yeah, but where I was was only men. Was was only men, and it was overcrowded. It was. It's not a nice place. It really isn't a nice place. And uh, the worst thing is, is you don't you don't exercise. You know, you're just locked in that room, and there are people that that have been there for four years and they've never been outside. 
for four years. And if you, if you don't have money to go home, you stay there until somebody gets money for you to go home. And um, yeah, that was sad. That was sad to see. And then another humiliating bit was coming home. You know, I watched your thing going home. They let you on the plane first. You know, even though I was the first one at the waiting area, they let me on the plane last. Yeah, where everybody else has sat down and, you know, and I'm, my passport's been taken off me and I'm, you know. And then, same thing, coming out. They let everybody out first and then I was the last one to... Um, to get off and I was actually thinking the immigration going to pull me you know but <laughs> they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't do anything and were you in handcuffs on the plane on the way home no 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 they took the handcuffs off when I was waiting to board yeah and but it was all I was grateful all the way through it, through that experience because I kind of knew I'm going home I'm going home and it was good to touch down again, you know, in England. And, um, and I appreciate England again, you know, because <laughs> England was somewhere where, I thought, ah, it, you know, I wanted to be in Thailand all the time, you know, but England is such a beautiful country, you know. We're so lucky here in England because I've got loads of support, really, from organisations and people and friends and that, you know. So I'm kind of grateful for for, yeah, for England, yeah. The property yeah. you'd accumulated during your incarceration, when your mates know you're about to leave, did they hit you up to leave them the stuff? Oh, yeah, everything you have to give away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything, everything. What did you have? You know, because me, I had clothes, you know, I had shoes. What else did I have that? Yeah, mainly, mainly clothes, really. And I gave it to my boy that... That works for me, really. I gave him everything, even though other people wanted. You, you know, foreigners don't want what you want, what you've got. It's only Thais who want what you've got, really. Were so. you not allowed, like, a little radio or anything? No, no. nothing like that. <laughs> nothing like that. Nothing like that. Only, only clothes, because you can buy clothes there, you know, so... No. Yeah, it was like the other wing, the first wing that I was at, it was kind of like a, and football shirts are the main, everybody wants to, if you've got a football shirt on, you're one of the top lads. <laughs> you're a top boy. Any specific team? Any team, really. <laughs> <you're> lucky. <laughs> Any team. So people were, were selling football shorts, football tops and stuff like that. So yeah, but what, I'm glad to be home now. What was your first meal? Home. English breakfast. I love a good English breakfast. English breakfast. How did that feel after all those years? Oh, felt fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it felt it felt great. It felt it felt really really good, really good because I'd been eating rice, 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 rice in the morning, rice in the afternoon. I mean, if you're lucky, you got money, you can eat bread in the morning. But if you haven't got any money, you're eating rice and cabbage in the morning. Rice that water's just been put inside for lunch, and then in the evening you're eating rice with with cabbage again, and that's every day. And if you're lucky, some days they might give you beans, yeah, which is quite popular. The best meal that I actually had in that prison was um, pineapple curry. That sounds good. Oh, nice. that does yeah, sound nice. that was lovely, man. Uh, that, I went back for seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I went back for seconds, but it was like they cooked pineapple in this in this chicken curry thing, and that was that was nice. Well, you're making me hungry now. <laughs> so, what was life like coming back after all that time? Where did you start off? Well, uh, you know, I kind of got in touch with my friends again, and um, I had to find somewhere to live. Um, prisoners abroad, you know, met me at the airport and then put me in a backpacker's hostel, which kind of, with my addiction, because I'd managed to stay clean for five years, and that's that's one of, that's the most important thing in my life right now is being staying clean and sober again. And um, they put me in this backpacker's hostel in Hammersmith that was in a pub. So 
my sobriety. I mean, I wasn't going to use, but it was a dangerous place for me to be at the same time. So I kind of rang him up and they put me in another hostel in King's Cross. And this one was just full of European kids, like 14, 15 year old children. And, you know, uh, you know, like they're doing their holiday thing and, and stuff like that. But because I knew that I knew the industry here, the homelessness. I worked in homelessness in hostels uh, for many, many years here. So I had connection and I had connection in the fellowship. So I was able to get into this house called Kairos House that caters for ex-prisoners. So if you've been out of prison, they'll, they'll let you stay in their house. And, um, and luckily for me, there was a vacancy there. I had an interview and um, I moved in straight away. And, um, and now I've got my flat. I got offered a flat on Friday. And since I've been back as well, I've done a course. Um, I've done a sober coaching course, uh, online course via South Africa. So I want to start working as a sober coach again, helping addicts and stuff like that. So, yeah, there's, there's a bright future ahead of me. You know, I've put putting things in place. Um, yeah. So when you first got out there and you're tasting that food and you're like hyper appreciative, how long did that last? Do you, do you still feel that? Because you've only been out for four months. I st you know, I think really, to be honest with you, my freedom won't start until I actually move into this place. Mm. Because since I've been out four months, I, everywhere I stay, there's always somebody there. So this flat, when I actually go in there, I'll be there on my own. You know, I don't need to worry about, oh, eating and leaving the plate there and somebody having a go at me, why ain't you wash that plate, you know? <laughs> so there's still more to experience. When my freedom really will, will be, really, I won't measure it until I'm actually in my own, my own place. But it's still exciting times. You know, I'm still, I went to the West End. Tottenham Court Road, and I lost my bearings. I didn't know where I was. I mean, I grew <laughs> up in the West End, and there's buildings that have just appeared everywhere, and I'm thinking, wow, things have changed a lot, because I was in Thailand for about 18, 19 years, and um, so, so it was a long time. So I'm still getting used to um, life in, in London again. What about being in round crowds and busyness and things like that? Does that affect yeah, you? Yeah, it does. I get panicky and that, you know, yeah, I suffer from, I suffer from depression as well, you know, because what I went through is very traumatic. I have nightmares, you know, um, I have panic attacks, I'm anxiety, anxiety. Attacks. I mean, coming up here today was a bit, all right, you know, but, it, you know, I, I matched through it because I knew I was doing something positive, you know, so, yeah, I'm still... On an emotional level, I'm still thawing now. I'm still kind of part. This is, will be part of the healing process. Me getting out what what I needed to get out. And speaking of positive things, then we like to weave in life lessons to young people in these interviews. So, what do you say to young people who are tempted to get involved in drugs in countries like Thailand and think it's just <sighs> it's not a joke, man? Don't do it. But the, the, the thing is, I knew what the consequences are if I get caught with drugs. But once you use, those consequences don't appeal to you. It's not going to happen to you. That's why I, I didn't think this was going to happen to me. You know, drugs were a big no-no for me for many, 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 many years after I got clean. But once I stepped over that line and used again, I'd lost all control. I was powerless again. So for any youngsters out there, don't use, I mean, I can't say don't use drugs, but there are dire consequences. I mean, people lose their lives. You know, Mario, my friend, he lost his life in a Thai jail. You know, all he did was have a gram of ice. So be, be, be careful what you're doing before you do it. You know, Thailand's not, it's not a joke country. They deal with drugs. People use drugs severely there. 
I know an English person who's doing 38 years. 38 years. So that's a long time. It's a long time. And people watching these videos, sometimes they want to reach out to the guest. Are you on, available on social media or anything? Yeah, I mean, I've got a website. If anybody... Um, Send it over to me, I'll forward yeah, that and put that in yeah, the description. Yeah, yeah. Say, the, say the name of it as well. Um, StayCleanAndSoberLondon.com yeah, that's my that's my website. And um, if anybody needs any support regarding drugs and alcohol, you know they can always reach out to me, and I can take them to a meeting. You know, to Narcotics Anonymous it saved my life. You know, it saved my life. Narcotics Anonymous. And it was Mark Dempster referred us, mm. and we've had to, we've done two podcasts with Mark Dempster. If you've not seen him, he's a very funny storyteller. Um, how, how did you and Mark, you know, get together? What, recently? No, how did you how did you, you get to know each other? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I met him in a in a meeting. You know, I met him in a meeting about twenty years ago, and uh, and we've been friends since. And it, it, the fellowship is like family. We're like family, mm -hmm. and we don't we, we don't shoot our win, wounded. You know, we don't let that. That's what was shown to me. The fellowship showed me that even me relapsing, they didn't leave me alone. They make sure I was looked after, and the fellowship is like that. Mark, that's why I contacted Mark, and and you know we met up, and then he called you, Jenny, and yeah. then that's how we got this thing, this thing yeah. going. No, thank you, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Mark. <laughs> Lovely to meet you. Yeah. So I think an important thing is, to please, people, if you're looking for a prison charity to support prisoners abroad, yes, I've been talking about this for years. We support them. And they do such wonderful work helping UK citizens who are in foreign prisons. Now, in some foreign prisons, if you need life-saving medicine and you can't buy it, you're going to die. Mm. So they are literally going in there and financing this medicine and saving people's lives. And you've heard Dee, you know, talk about the, the role that they played in his journey. So please support Prisoners Abroad. Um, huge thank you for coming on, man. Yeah, yeah, it's been, yeah. Wow. Good work. Thanks for having me. Just to say about the prisoners abroad, they support you when you come back too. It doesn't just stop when you come out of prison. They support you for another year after coming out of prison. So I'm still in contact with prisoners abroad now. So yeah, it's a good charity. Yeah, yeah it really, it really is. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Well, thank you again, D. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, give us a hug, man. This podcast is sponsored by Gadfly Press. We are proud to announce the publication of Britain's number one art forger, Max Brandert, The Life of a Cheeky Faker. And from the back cover blurb, Max the Forger is an artist and gentleman whose colourful lifestyle has spanned over 70 years. He has lived under the strict regime of Bernardo's children's homes, been an elephant handler in the circus, lived rough, busked his way from Brighton to Bombay, sold his fakes up and down the country, dined with dukes, socialised with celebrities, associated with gangsters, served time in prison, and donated tens of thousands to charity. And through it all, he has never stopped smiling and loving life and missing his mum. Quote from the book. Mr. Brandert, I do not see you as a malicious criminal, sighed the judge. But why, oh why, do you continue to use your God-given talent in this way? I just can't help myself, Your Honour. It's like an addiction, I grinned. Available worldwide on Amazon, link in the description box below this video. Thank you for supporting our sponsor.